that it touches us in a special way and allows our hearts to be more softer than it's ever been towards you, God, and allows you to direct us in all of our paths, in all of our way, in the way we speak, the way we act, the way we move, and that we become more and more and more like your son, Jesus Christ, who gave up so much for us and allowed us to be here with you. I pray all this in your son, Jesus' name.
Good morning, church. Um, good morning to everyone present here and those on Zoom. I'm Ray Clark, and this is my wife, Tina. And in, <laughs> and in case you didn't notice, we've been around a while, and there's a lot of history behind this. Uh, I'm from Barbados, and a Caribbean island, and Tina is from Venezuela. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the Garden State Church. <laughs> Tina and I were welcomed to New Jersey over 40 years ago. And, you know, in many er we lived in many areas in New York City. And then when we did come to New Jersey, it was like a breath of fresh air. Uh, so whether you're visiting or part of the church, we want you to, be, to feel welcome. Yeah. Okay, and the, the, wel the feeling of being welcome, you know, is being... You know, belong, that sense of belonging, sense of comfort, and security. Mm -hmm. And we hope that, you, you know, you get all these today. Mm -hmm. I know Tina had something to share. Well, uh, when we moved to New Jersey, uh, we were looking for a place to worship in New Jersey. We started a family, and we visited many churches in New Jersey. We met someone who invited us to a church in New York. Uh, so that was not our plan, but it was God's plan. Uh, well, after visiting many churches, we landed on this one. And it has been 38 years now since we have been coming to church. We were a lot younger back then. Uh, but God bless us with three children. Uh, and right now, we have five grandchildren, all boys. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to have a sixth grandchild, another boy. <laughs> God has his plan and his sense of humor also. That was my last hope for a girl. <laughs> Well, this place has a lot, of, lot to offer, okay? And uh, take it from me, from us, actually. We know a thing or two because we have seen a thing or two, right? Amen. <laughs> but let's encourage one another. You know, this is what we do when we come to church. Let's encourage each other as we sing, pray, worship, give each other smiles, hugs, good conversation. There's a lot of good stuff that can happen here. Uh, one of our grandson is here, Noah. Noah, can you wave? <laughs> He's a preteen, so preteen, you got your job to encourage Noah. <laughs> I invite you to open your mind, your heart, your soul, and see what God sees. And allow him to teach you something today, even if it's just something a little. It's good to be taught. Uh, Jesus came with a great invitation to offer all of us. Let's take advantage of that today. Amen. I'm going to share a scripture with you now, Isaiah 55, 1 and 2. Let's turn it. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come. Buy grain and eat. Come, buy wine and milk. Without money and without cost, simply accept it as a gift from God. Why do you spend money for what, uh, for which is not bread, and your earnings for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me. And eat what is good, and let your soul delight in abundance. And Tina will pray for us. Let us all pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for allowing us to have the opportunity and the freedom to worship you today. Lord, many nations around the world right now don't have that, but we have. Many are hurting and wondering what's going to happen next. And we are yet here, God, with this great offer that you 
are given us. Lord, we pray that we connect with you today, that we're in tune with what you are teaching us. Grant us peace that transcends all understanding. Help us to focus on Jesus and his teaching. We pray, God, for many needs that are present today. We pray for Chuck that is not feeling well. Father, um, we pray for many people who are mourning, who are hurting, Lord, but we are confident, God, that you are there for them. Heavenly Father, we love you and we ask you uh, all this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Jesus is Lord. Sorry, I messed it up, y'all. No, you did it. You did it. You might have tried it. Trying out here. I'm gonna find it. Ready? All right. Jesus is Lord.
Hello, everyone. Um, good morning. Please raise your hand if you need a communion cup, and one of the ushers will bring one to you. Hello, everyone. My name is Annette Allen, and during this communion, I'm going to share what the cross means to me. As I reflect on Jesus' sacrifice in this season of my life, I think about hope. It could be hard at times to feel hopeful when I'm facing so many personal challenges with my health, work, dealing with so many losses, and all of the turmoil going on in the world. You may feel the same, just fill in the blanks with your challenges. In the last five years, I experienced 10 deaths of family members and friends where I just lost my younger brother uh, last July. I've had several miscarriages, and most recently last month, was harassed at work by my manager for over a year and a half, and the new manager is exhibiting some of the same signs. I've had surgery last year, and now found out I need two more surgical procedures. It can feel like the challenges do not end, and it could be hard to be engaged with others, and find the joy in life and wondering what is going on. I can't say that I have been able to process all that has happened, but I'm hopeful that at the right time, the Lord will make a way for me to have the time to deeply reflect on how he has been working in my life during these times. However, the Bible encourages me so much when I try to understand what is happening. In 1 Peter 4.12, I'm reminded that I'm not living in the twilight zone. <laughs> you know, God says in verse 12, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on to you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. The Bible tells us there is hope, and to find it, we usually have to look up to God rather than down at ourselves or even our own community. In Romans 5, 1 to 5, it says, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into his, this grace in which we now stand and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. I am so encouraged by these scriptures because my hope will not put me to shame. And I keep enduring these challenges and God willing, my character will develop. My mindset has changed. So now I am faithful in many things I have, I have hoped for. And I see that things are improving, right? In Hebrews 11, one, it says, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. The Bible says that Jesus knows our pain, our suffering. He has firsthand experience of grief, injustice, humiliation, suffering, and loss. Jesus has not avoided any of these hard areas of life. He has gone through them himself. He has asked the hard questions. He has personal experience of how tough it can be. So in Romans 15, 13, together in unity as we partake of the bread and the wine, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Communion is a time to remember the sacrifice of Jesus Christ who gave his body 
and blood for us on the cross. Communion is also a time to fellowship with God. So as we share in the bread and the cup that symbolize his presence and his covenant with each of us, let us pray to remember his sacrifice. Father God, thank you so much for this time, God, to be with you and for us to be here together. God, your word is so powerful. Uh, you instill in us hope and faith. Thank you for the sacrifice that you have given us, God, that you are resurrected, that you know each and every heart, each and every pain and suffering, God, and you work all things out for our good. God, keep allowing us to draw nearer and closer to you, Father God. Uh, thank you, God, that even when we don't understand, you do, that you make a way when we can't even see a way. So, Father, I pray, God, um, that we continue to just hold tight to you and continue to remember that you are with us. It is in Jesus' name that I pray all of these things. Amen. And that will conclude our time of communion. Thank you so much, Annette, for that amazing message. I will be giving you guys the announcements today. So it's not a lot today. So um, we can. Um, so uh, we are not passing the plates around anymore. So if you would like to give for contribution, um, our weekly offering is taken at nyccoc.net slash donate or you could scan that QR code. This week, we'll have two midweek services. One will be, no, we're not gonna have two midweek services because <laughs> there's gonna be one in the Northwest at Embassy Suites at 7.30. And then for our group here, the Northeast, we're gonna be meeting in life teams. So this is a time that you guys can connect and connect during the week with your life team. Next Sunday, we will have uh, service here at Clifton High School at 10 a.m. The Northeast will meet here, and then the Northwest will be meeting in life teams. So a little flip-flop there. And then uh, this is an opportunity for, for anybody who would like to be trained with Hope Worldwide. There's going to be a workshop happening on Saturday, April 27th, um, and that'll be in New York. You can sign up at the Volunteer Hub. But you can find all of this information at our church website, GardenStateChurch.com. <laughs> and then we'll be having a alumni chemical recovery gathering. And so this is for um, this is for women who maybe have graduated from the chemical recovery group, or maybe who are curious about developing spiritual convictions regarding substance use that you, anyone like that is welcome to attend. And there will be refreshments and it'll be in the cafeteria out there on Sunday, May 5th. La, um, we'll have a spring semi-formal for the teens. So an opportunity to get dressed up. We'll also be honoring our seniors this year. So that'll be on May 18th at Lehman College. 
special contribution is coming up, guys. It is on its way. That'll be in June 2024. Start giving in June. So just, you know, keep that on your mind. It's coming up. <laughs> And then also coming up in the summer, we have our teen camp, Chat G-O-D. Woo! <laughs> um, it'll be from August 11th to 17th, and the registration is open already. And then there will be a life team leaders meeting today after church in the cafeteria at 12:15. And for all other information, you can find that at gardenstatechurch.com. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Why don't we stand on up? We're going to sing one more song before we hear the message. And some of you guys may not know this song, but I encourage you to listen to the words and meditate a little bit. We all deal with so much, and this song is an encouragement to hold, to, to hold out, to persevere, to endure, and to not turn back from God. Amen? Amen. Come on. Amen. Well, I promised the Lord that I would hold out, hold out, hold out. I promised the Lord that I would hold out. Meet me in Jerusalem. And I promised the Lord that I would hold out. Hold out. I'd hold out. I promised the Lord that I would hold out. Meet me in Jerusalem. You see now, my Lord done just what he said. Yes, he did. Oh, yes, he did. He Heal the sick, my Lord raised the dead now. Yes, he did. Oh, yes, he did. Well, I promised the Lord that I would hold out. Hold out. Hold out. I promised the Lord that I would hold out. Meet me in Jerusalem. See, I promised the Lord that I will endure. I will endure. I will endure. I promise the Lord that I will endure. Meet me in Jerusalem. See now, my Lord done just what he said. Yes, he did. Oh, yes, he did. He healed the sick. My Lord raised the dead now. Yes, he did. Oh, yes, he did. Well, I promise the Lord that I would hold out. Hold out, I'd hold out. I promised the Lord that I would hold out. Meet me in Jerusalem. See, I promised the Lord that I'd persevere. I'd persevere. Oh, I'd persevere. I promised the Lord that I would persevere. So meet me in Jerusalem. See, now my Lord done. Just what he said. Yes, he did. Oh, yes, he did. He healed the sick. My Lord raised the dead now. Yes, he did. Oh, yes, he did. Well, I promised the Lord that I would hold out. I'd hold out. I'd hold out. I promised the Lord that I would hold out. Meet me in Jerusalem. I promise the Lord that I won't turn back. I won't turn back. No, I won't turn back. I promise the Lord that I won't turn back. Meet me in Jerusalem. See now, my Lord done just what he said. Yes, he did. Oh, yes, he did. He healed the sick. My Lord raised the dead now. Yes, he did. Oh, yes, he did. Well, I promised the Lord that I would hold out. I'd hold out. I'd hold out. I promised the Lord that I would hold out. Meet me in Jerusalem. Come on, y'all. 
everybody meet me in Jerusalem. Everybody meet me in Jerusalem. Sisters, won't you meet me in Jerusalem? Brothers, won't you meet me in Jerusalem? Cabins, won't you meet me in Jerusalem? I would hold out, I'd hold out, I'd hold out. I'd hold out. I promised the Lord that I would hold out. Meet me in Jerusalem. Amen. You may be seated. All right. Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? Was that an amazing song? Let's give it up for our worship team. That was excellent. So I'm here this morning to introduce our guest speaker. Some know him as Mr. Casada, Dad, Cuz, Cuzzo. But to me, this is future. Now you say, future? What on When Andreas became a Christian, he was this excited campus student at Montclair State. And all he wanted to do was win the world for Jesus. And I said, dude, I like that. <laughs> and so I remember giving him the nickname Future because he was the future at that time. I'm 53, yes. <laughs> and Andreas isn't far behind, but the future has come. Now he's married 20 years, 20 years. three, Amazing daughters, unbelievable wife, and I've got to watch it happen. The future is grown up. And so today, we're going to begin a series discussing relationships. We're going to focus on the one another way, because part of why he's here today is because of the one another way. Relationship with God and relationship with one another. And so without further ado, I give you my dear brother, Andreas Future Casada. <laughs> do you think, bro? Amen. Amen, church. It is good to be here this morning. And wow, that was that was an intro. Oh, what's oh, okay. Oh, oh, there you go. Stop there already. Clarks, I see your six boys. I raised you three daughters. Let's see how that goes. And thank you, Annette, for uh, for sharing. Uh, definitely, the spirit is moving this morning, and uh, we are all connected with one spirit. So uh, this morning, I wanted to share with you guys about a relational God. And so, the title of the message is "Connecting with the Ultimate Influencer." Do you guys like that title? I actually. Had a little help. Let's see if this works. No, which way? Oh, back up. <laughs> oh, too much. Oh, my goodness. There we go. Okay, so. No? All right. There it is. So I asked Chad GTP. Give me a hip title to a message about having a relationship with God. And this is what he came up with. Actually, pretty good. Divine vibes, cultivating your connection with the ultimate influencer. So I figured, you know, I'm going to stick with that title. That's pretty good. There you go. Chat G-O-D. Teens know about that. 
So today I'm going to try to scratch the surface on how we may connect with God. Mainly how God connects with us through his word, his people, prayer, difficulties. I mean, there are a lot of ways that he does it, right? Is it the other way? Ah, there we go. Got it. Okay. Ah, that's my family right there. Yeah. The Casadas. So Shil in the middle, Siomara, and Sol right on the bottom. Momsara, my wife, 20 years married. You know, just a just a normal family. And I bring them out because family, in my opinion, gets a large slice. Of all the ways that we can connect with God. And I want to share about that today. So let's dive in. How do we connect with God? How exactly does this happen? Have you ever wondered, is this the kind of stuff that keeps you up at night? I sometimes get lost in the idea that the creator of the universe, the same God that came out with the rules of the universe, the one that spoke into existence, the one whose words do not return to him empty, that God, the one that set the limits of the universe, and then told us that he set the limits of the universe. And it wasn't until maybe the last 500 years or so that we kind of begin to even understand what those limits were. Let's turn your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 40. I love this one. I'm sure a lot of you do as well. The Bible reads, do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was formed? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and his people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of the world to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner do they take root in the ground, than he blows on them and they wither, and a whirlwind sweeps them away like shaft. To whom will you compare me, or who is my equal, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? He who brings out the stereo holes one by one and calls for each of them by name. Because of his great power and mighty strength, not one of them is missing. Let's not even get into the fact that this 2,800-year-old scripture it's talking about, you know, around earth and explaining the expanding skies, right? Look at this one in Job 26, another one of my favorites. He spreads out the northern skies over the empty space. He suspends the earth over nothing. He wraps up the waters in his clouds, yet the clouds do not burst under their weight. He covers the face of the full moon, spreading his clouds over it. He marks out the horizon on the face of the waters for a boundary between light and darkness. The pillars of the heavens quake, aghast at his rebuke. By his power, he churned up the sea. By his wisdom, he cut, out, he cut Rahab to pieces. By his breath, the skies became fair. His hand pierced the gliding serpent. And these are but an outer fringe of his works. How faint the whisper we hear of him. Who then can understand the thunder of his power? You know, this is interesting to me. How faint the whisper we hear of him. Who then can understand the thunder of his power? Let that sink in for a little bit, you know. Again, without dwelling too much on the earth, suspended over nothing and the expanding skies again, right? And these are but a fringe of his works. We're just getting started. He's just getting started because his works is not just the creation. It's also us. It's also relationships. It's also the inner works of ourselves, right? These are great scriptures, and there are many more that when I read them, I keep finding whoever inspired them, i.e. God, I keep finding him more and more reliable and more and more trustworthy. We can see through scripture that he is reliable and that he reveals to us. He reveals to us through his word that, that what he reveals to us is true and reasonable. How do we establish now that he wants a relationship with us? It's not always entirely evident, right? How do we come to that conclusion? God, the same God that the scriptures are talking about, he wants to be close with me, with you. Why? How? What are the requirements, the rules for walking with God? How does he tell us? I figure maybe we can look at some more scriptures 
and try to draw some insight, draw some pointers on how to get close to God and how to walk with him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your mercy, for your love, for being with us, God, for the way that you move, for your works and your mercy, your, your sacrifice for us. We thank you, God, that you are with, her, with us today, this morning. I just pray that you can guide our thoughts uh, as we dive into the scriptures. In the name of your son, Jesus, I pray. Amen. You know, I had a really hard time coming up with, uh, with a standard answer of, you know, how we connect with God. I've come to the conclusion that we all walk with God differently, which makes sense because we're all so different, right? I look around the room and, I mean, there's no one like you. Look next to you. There's no one like you. Even twin brothers and sisters are very, very different, right? And just like God set the rules of the universe in place, I've come to believe that he, the, the first rule he set in place is how we walk with him, is that we all walk with him differently. It's not a one-size-fits-all. It just can't be. Luke 12, verses uh, 6 and 7, Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You're worth more than many sparrows. You know, our DNA alone is proof that God wants us to be our unique selves. You know, there's no carbon copy, no repeats, right? If we were all the same, then he wouldn't say that our heads are counted, that all the hairs in our head are counted. He would say, and again, I had a little help. I asked chat GTP, how many hairs does the average human have? 150,000, but it doesn't say that, right? It doesn't say all 150,000 hairs in your head will be counted. No, it says your hairs will be counted, your individual hairs, how many you may have, right? Some of us have more than others, so some might take a little more time to count, right, Spain? I'm sorry, I don't know if Spain is here. <laughs> and you know, I took a DNA test recently. I went to Ancestry.com, and I took one of those. I don't know if you guys have ever done one of these. So there were a lot of mixed uh, feelings in my house. <laughs> when this came up, I was called a colonizer at some point. <laughs> Other names were called uh, that I cannot share at church. <laughs> feelings may, have, may or may not have been hurt. And you know, when you keep looking at all my ancestry, uh, and there was another page further down that was talking about the less than 1%, right? And so <laughs> I found that under the, under the less than 1%, uh, let me mix. I have some Jamaican ancestry. <laughs> Again, it's less than 1%. Well, my kids spend the next week calling me colonizer and other related derogatives with a Jamaican accent. And you know, we're all curious about our heritage, but when we see the level of diversity in our DNA, I can't help but think about how our God also made us spiritually and emotionally diverse. So don't be afraid to be different. Embrace it. This is how you were made. And we got to figure out how to connect with God in our own way. You know, he's trying to connect with us at our most basic individual level. Come and walk with him as you are. Like the scripture said, I do not believe that he talks to us in the whispers. But I don't do well with quiet times. This doesn't mean I don't read the Bible. Hear me out. It's just that it's never quiet in my head. It's always something going on. and It's always revving up. I cannot sit still. I've come to the conclusion that I probably have undiagnosed ADD my whole life. And my attention span at any given moment is just like all over the place, right? But it's not that I have an attention deficit. I think, I don't know how to explain it. It's more like 10 different things always have my attention at all the time. I call it, I don't know, 10 times attention disorder. And I don't want a cure. That's, that's actually my superpower. But the question is, so how do I connect with God, right? With all this going on in my head at all times. So I think one of the ways that God connects with me is that he gives us, he gives me, he gives us scriptures 
that can be read and reread ten times, and each time you'll find something different, right? He gives us scriptures and verses that when I hold them up to scrutiny, I find them to be reliable and trustworthy, like the first two scriptures I read uh, that I shared with you earlier. You know, my quiet time sometimes is just opening the Bible, reading a verse, sometimes a chapter, and these words are so densely packed, I can just chew on them for a day, for two days, for a week. I can keep coming back to it. There's always something new there. It's okay to be different. It's okay to connect with God through worship. It's okay not to sometimes. It's okay to connect with God with meeting other people's needs. It's okay to find a quiet place and read and pray. We can all connect with him through his word, read it, examine it, scrutinize it, question it. I've gotten closer to God at different times and different uh, ways throughout my life. And the next one that I want to share about is marriage. Oh, man. Look at this guy. <laughs> the things you will see. The places you will go to, young Jedi. Look at these two. They only knew. Now, who in here is convinced that your character is exposed and then shaped a marriage. Yeah, I want to see all those hands up, Mary, Mary Brothers. Come on. That's what I'm talking about. And how do you know that? Well, because after turmoil and craziness, God speaks to us in the whispers that is my life, my wife, sorry. If you're willing to change, you will hear the whispers, the calm after the storm. That's the time of renewal. I know it is for me. But you don't know what the quiet whispers are unless you've been through the storms, right? And I think Annette was sharing about that earlier today. And we just celebrated 20 years. And I got to say, that was last week at the marriage retreat. I got to say that it's by the mercy of God that this woman has helped me walk with God in ways that I did not think was possible. This woman has shown me love, but also mercy and forgiveness and grace had I not seen and experienced these things from her directly, I'm not sure that I would have understood them from the creator of the universe. She makes me better. She draws me closer to God. And we can do that with each other. Not just marriage. All relationships can draw us closer to God and help us connect with him. God stretched out his hand to connect with us through people. People around you, family, spouses, roommates, and also little people, maybe especially little people. You see, God just took it up a notch, right? Right when I was finally getting comfortable, he sent me these characters alone. Oh, there's one. There's a shill. And, you know, I don't mean little people because little people have no say on where they go, right? You just kind of drag them around. And you just have to go wherever you go. I don't know if so she will remember this, but she was being dragged around this time. But then something happens. And suddenly, they want to dress themselves. <laughs> they have opinions. They have strong opinions. They will argue with you and oppose you for no reason. It's like arguing with myself. <laughs> I don't know where she gets it from. I'm already having 10 arguments in my head, so I don't need another one. You know, when my oldest uh, daughter, Sushil, was younger, she decided that she would write a paper about the proof that God exists. Oh, boy, I was thinking at the time. I went down that road before. Will it hurt her faith? And where would she get such an idea? And I'm not saying that proof is what we need or what we get, but I am saying that God has a way of providing us with just enough evidence. And then our faith has to get us the rest of the way. You know, she really wrestled with that paper. She struggled through it. Uh, applying the scientific method to faith is, is not going to work out the way some of us think because I wrestle with the same things, right? But after wrestling with God and after the thunder and the earthquakes comes the whisper. Earlier this year, Sushil made Jesus Lord. And God knows, I didn't really have anything to do with that. She had to fight her own battle of faith. She had to wrestle with God herself. And, of course, there was a group of sisters helping her along the way, right? A whole village was involved. Thank you, guys. And in that, she reminded me of my own battle of faith. Now, 
nothing brings you closer to God than jumping into a car with your 16-year-old <laughs> that is just learning how to drive. But also nothing brings you closer to God than talking with your daughter who is now your sister. You know, I have an issue at work, a decision I needed to make that would change somebody's life for the better. And I was on the train with Sir Shill. This is last week. We were on our way to uh, Radio City Hall to hear a lecture by Dr. Jordan Peterson uh, titled, We Who Wrestle With God. I figure, you know, she wrestled with God, I wrestle with God, she wrestles with me, it's perfect. <laughs> well, on the way there, I was telling Sushil about the situation at work uh, and the decision I had to make. I went on and on about the 10 different ways that I was thinking about it and how I approached the issue, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And after listening to me for a while, she just said, but did you pray? Mm. No, I didn't. <laughs> No, I hadn't. Let's read in 1 Peter 3, verse 8 to 12. Finally, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Listen, that verse right there is a whole message that we can all have. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing, because to this you were called, that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. <clears throat> love the scripture. You know, in our walk with God, uh, we, I, we tend to overcomplicate things, right? Just pray. We can all connect with God with prayer. We can whisper to him as well, you know? You know, I still got two other daughters, and they also bring me closer to God in their own way. This is uh, Xiomara on the left. Her name means ready for battle. The soul on the right is just sun, like the sun spelled with an X. She definitely brings the heat. And I, could, I have stories, boy, do I have stories. And they're like a one-two combo, right? Turn your Bibles to uh, 1 King, verse uh, 19. I'm sorry, 1 King chapter uh, 19, verses 11 through 14. And we'll be there in just a little bit. I'll close with that scripture. Uh, but I want to share with you guys a story about Xiomara's birth. Uh, many of you know this story. <laughs> so just bear with me. It was, uh, it was a nice June morning. I get up that morning, and my wife comes up to me, and she goes, hey, can you watch the baby? I want to just go get my nails done. And I'm like, sure. And as I say sure, she goes to the ground and screams in pain. She's about, I don't know, 13 months pregnant at this point. So <laughs> it's happening, and it's happening today, right? And so I'm like, uh, OK. I mean, are you sure you can get your nails done? And she's like, well, fine. I'm not getting my nails done, but I'm definitely taking a shower. Maybe that was a bad idea. So I run, I pack up the baby, uh, so she was three years old, I put her in the car, I get the hospital bag in the car, right? Uh, I go back to the house to get my wife, I'm helping her halfway through the backyard and she drops down in pain and screams again. I see a neighbor walking his dog going like, uh, you know, like oh, I don't want to be involved with this, I don't know what's going on over there. <laughs> Finally get in the car, I mean it is like madness, right? It's just, just screaming, there's uh, things happening, there's... Uh, <laughs> All kinds of questions being asked by a three-year-old on the back watching this whole thing unfold. Uh, and I said to Mom Sarah, all right, let's go to St. Barnabas Hospital. And of course, she goes, I'd rather give birth in the car than go to St. Barnabas Hospital. <laughs> Careful what you ask for. So I'm going to Morristown now. I'm driving, flying, get on 280, get on 80, get on the off-ramp right to 287. I think we're going to make it, right? And again, there's just craziness going on in the car, right? And, and I relate that to like just the craziness that we all face in life, right? There's just, it's just you don't know what's going to happen next. And then there's a quiet, there's a whisper. But this wasn't God talking to me from the back seat. No, this was Momsara saying, I think the baby's head is out. So as I'm driving, I look back, there's the baby's head. Baby comes out. Yep, hits the floor. I mean, it's more craziness now. <laughs> baby's slipping around. There's blood. There's... Yes, it's happening, it happened. 
Um, and I'm, I'm telling mom, Sarah, okay, can you pick out the baby? You know, got to gotta make sure it cries. I'm thinking the baby has to cry. I mean, she's giving birth, right? What am I thinking? I'm just driving. She finally grabs a hold of Xiomara, and she starts crying. I remember I took off my, you know, I, before I did that, actually, you know, I'm still driving. And so she goes, Daddy, Daddy, why does the baby have a tail? <laughs> you could ask so she right now. She does not want to have any babies. I, I, I don't blame her. And um, that's not all yet. So I call 911, and they tell me, you know, pull over. Just, just wait for, uh, you know, for us to catch up to you. So I pull over. I'm on the 287 off-ramp. And, uh, you know, I, I take off my shirt. I, I wrap up the baby. Uh, I mean, it's just madness, right? Uh, five minutes later, a trooper shows up. He's got his blue gloves on. He runs up to the car. He goes, oh, man, the baby's here. <laughs> he goes, it would have been my first. I, I guess there's a special wall at the trooper's station for those who get to deliver babies, right? So he was a little disappointed that the baby had already come. Uh, needless to say, you know, well, you know, ambulance comes. You know, I left the car there on the side of the road. We went to the hospital. Everybody, the baby was fine. Well, my mommy was fine. So she's been scarred for life. <laughs> and uh, later on in the afternoon, of course, I bring my car back home. And I'm power washing my car in my driveway, literally a river of blood going down my driveway. And there goes that same guy walking his dog. <laughs> and I'm thinking, the cops are going to knock on my door any moment now. And by the way, I never saw that guy again. I don't know who that was. I don't think he was a neighbor. You know, I wish there were times in my life when I would have been told that the Lord was about to pass by, right? And first uh, King, Kings 19.12, the Lord says, go out and stand on the, he's talking, uh, the God is talking to Elijah. He has just gone through his own little earthquake and madness and craziness, right? With the prophets of Baal and all that. So the Lord said, go and stand on the mountain, of, in, on the mountain in the presence of the Lord. For the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. Notice that it says before the Lord, right? So it's not like God wasn't there, right? Because sometimes we think that God is not there when we're going through this stuff. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. I always wonder how Elijah knew that that was it, right? Because me, I would have thought, is the earthquake, right? Definitely is the earthquake, or definitely is the fire, or definitely is like. But somehow he knew that the quiet whisper was the time to go face God. What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death, which is not true, right? With the sword, but that's how he's feeling. That's what he's thinking. And I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me, blah, blah. I mean, he's, he's having a hard time. You know, after the earthquake comes fire, but the Lord was not in it. There's craziness in life. Life itself is absolute bonkers, isn't it? But the birth of a child, I feel like that's on a different level. There's something visceral and gut-wrenching about the feel when a child is, is born. I've always wondered, what is God telling us through something like that? You know, the earthquake and the rock splitting and fire has, come, has, has to come first. And then God comes in the whisper. Who felt the earthquake a couple of weeks ago? That was scary, wasn't it? No, it wasn't. Stop it. That wasn't barely an earthquake. You know, I'm from Costa Rica, so I've been through some major earthquakes. I think the highest ever recorded was in Chile for a 9.5. Growing up in Costa Rica, I lived through a 7.0, a 7.6, a 7.7 .7 earthquake, and then a bunch of like 6.5s and under that they're just considered aftershocks, so they don't even count as uh, earthquakes. Now, the scariest, part about an er uh, the scariest part about an earthquake is that there's nowhere to run, right? Nowhere, nowhere is safe. Nowhere to hide. 
we were literally laid bare. And we had a 4.8 scale earthquake in New Jersey, and people were losing their minds. You know, when I read First Kings and I see uh, the earthquake that came before God's quiet whisper, I wonder, what are you telling us, God? Why the earthquakes and rock splitting winds first? Like, how many of us in the same situation would have heard God's voice in the whisper? Like me standing on the side of the highway with a newborn and three year old Sushil. It's just utter madness to think back to that day and see if I saw God in that earthquake and at that moment. But when I held my babies for the first time in my arms and everything was quiet, then I felt like I was seeing God, you know? It was very similar when Saul was born, by the way. Momsara literally gave birth, like she just gave birth. The doctor just stood there. She was like in this full suit, mask and things. She had done nothing. She just stood there. And she was trying to wrap her head around the fact that she just stood there. And I remember her saying to the nurse, I, I, I don't like this. I, I was in zero control. I had, I had no control. No kidding, doc. Welcome to my world. I never really have any control. I just think I do. And I think the earthquakes and the winds, the fires of our lives reminds us of just how fragile we really are. Just how little control we actually have. And then God comes in with a gentle whisper to let us know that we can turn to him after the earthquakes and the earth-shattering events in our lives. After the turmoil, after the craziness of life, God comes. Understand, God is there. We're just too distracted to see him. And I feel like in our fight, our flight response has us too pumped up to realize his presence sometimes. So he waits. And when we're ready, when we feel safe, he's ready to connect. But don't let life distract you from that connection. You know, for Job in the Bible, God talked to him in a hushed voice, and he had just gone through his own stuff, right? Moses in a, in a quiet, in a, in a burning bush. And just like the birth of a child can change your whole perspective, so does earthquakes, high winds, fires in our lives, like Annette was sharing. Thank you for sharing all that. It can help us turn to God. Those hardships, like you were saying, build the emotional and physical bandwidth so that we could be ready with our chat, with our FaceTime with God. Elijah had just gone through his own little earthquake, right? Both literally and figuratively. And what he needed was to hear God's voice and direction and connect with the ultimate influencer. It is also what we need. We just had a little, little earthquake in all our lives. And each of us is going through our own uh, mountain splitting difficulties. Turn to God. Turn to prayer, turn to family and friends, turn to the Bible and connect with the ultimate influencer. Thank you, guys. Hey Amen. You guys can stand on up. Uh, we're going to sing Anchor for the Soul, which feels very fitting knowing that the lyrics say thunder and lightning are very frightening, but God's in control. So thanks, Andres. Let's give it up again for a great message. It's awesome. All right, here we go. Anchor for the soul Shelter from the storm Way I love to reach my body. 
In the morning, blessings overflow. 